When one thinks of abstract art, the formal elements that come to mind the most are shape and color. These are what help give it life to add a sense of variety with sporadic colors and implied shapes that contribute to the stylistic choices in any non-objective imagery. As such, this art form has been experimented in the animation industry for years, but the growth of abstract animation differs between the 1930s and the 1950s, considering that these decades share differing ideologies and styles from their depictions alone. However, they do display a certain reaction the world had when the Second World War occurred. Both European and American abstract animated films represent the bleak outlook much of the world had after experiencing World War II. As historian Stephen Cavalier stated in The World History of Animation, animation entered into avant-garde territory in 1910 when Italian experimental artists Arnaldo Ghina and Bruno Cora sprouted their creativity through painting on film stock. Soon afterwards, plenty of German artists would create their own abstract film movement. But one member named Oscar Fischinger embraced this art form passionately by creating what historians call visual music. Fischinger described this work by saying art emphasizes the effect of music. This method helped establish these people as technical innovators who emphasized the grim spectacle common in German Expressionism in the 1920s, and Fischinger found an audience with his simple shapes moving in accordance to music. At heart, Oscar's intentions were to show people things out of this world by embracing the limitless possibilities found in animation through joy's melodies and energy. Music can really drive visuals through an emotional experience, and the colorful shapes in Fischinger's work really emphasize his ecstatic tendencies to create psychedelic fantasies to fascinate his viewers. Despite the Nazis deeming his art as degenerate due to their dislike of abstract art, causing Fischinger to move to California in 1936, he still prospered in studios like MGM and Disney, creating surrealistic imagery that would transcend audiences into a world of colorful fantasy. Speaking of which, the 1930s were the time of the Great Depression, and animation was one of the many things that kept the public happy, with cartoons like Popeye and Mickey Mouse scoring big at box offices. In America, attending movies allowed people to escape from the uncertainties, anxieties, and loss of self-esteem associated with the Depression years. As a result, cartoon characters dancing to songs in surreal worlds became the norm of animation around that time. However, by the time World War II broke out in 1939, that's when people began to pay less attention to the technical wonders and upbeat tones of animated films, and most animation would later be used as propaganda. <laughs> With Europe facing the Nazi invasion, this would result in the downfall of certain art forms like abstract expressionism for, once again, being seen as inferior by der Fuhrer's power. Not only that, but most economics were given to support the troops, meaning that the budgets for studios decreased. But that did not necessarily mean a downfall in creativity. Back in America, while Walt Disney strove for realism in imitating life, several of his animators wanted to strive towards surrealism in their work. Following the infamous Disney animator strike of 1941, several of Disney's artists and animators, including Art Babbitt and John Hubley, formed a commercial animation enterprise called Industrial Film and Poster Service with producer Stephen Bustustow, later metamorphosized as United Productions of America. They aspired through limited animation with fewer and simpler drawings, which despite breaking the rules of Disney's believable animation, felt unique and more visually interesting. See, all these people had been ex-Disney people, and, and when they were draft or win the service, they, they most of them were over at Fort Roach, right near here, at, uh, and, uh, and they learned about, uh, about uh, not they learned, there they were able to express a lot of the frustration that they could at Disney. They could animate cartoons, you know? As fantastic as Disney's realistic character animation is, it does faintly lose sight of what animation stands for, imaginary imagery. When looking at the more curve-shaped designs of UPA, they fit more in the realm of animation due to having more minimal, albeit creative worlds, as if they came from the minds of cartoonists. Their art style represented the more modern graphic style of the 1940s, from minimal detail, landscapes composed of bare geometry, and limited character movements. By focusing more on style, the crew of UPA were able to challenge animation through dramatic stories rather than humor, a huge deviation from the 1930s when most animation was made to generate laughs. Following the rise of both post-war art and the Cold War in the early 1950s, John Hubley left UPA due to refusing to cooperate with the House Un-American Activities Committee, which got him blacklisted. Upon moving to New York with his wife Faith, they set up their own studio and made their own original experimental short films, including the Oscar-winning Moonbird. 
Based on tape recordings of their son's improvised play on searching for a creature called the Moonbird, the film utilizes a neutralized and dark color scheme that adds to the mystery of searching for a strange creature, with very dark blues and blacks at night. While the boys are lively in both design and animation, the design of the Moonbird itself is what stands out more due to how oversimplified it is, mainly since it comes from the imagination of two little kids who only know so much about what a bird may look like. The non-objective shapes present the film with a dreamlike quality, with the bizarre figures adding in to the mysteriousness of imaginary creatures that the mind can only see when they are young and spirited. The overall forms have a more organic structure with thick outlines caused by the dark background. However, the tone is also a little grim given its macabre night setting, keeping the viewer wondering when this moonbird will show up. The textures appear semi-transparent, leaving the moonbird itself to blend in with the environment. All the mentioned formal elements highlight the macabre fantasy world of a child's imagination, and the unique animation style creates an identity for the film to let it stand out from realism. Unlike most cartoons of the 30s, several cartoons of the 50s created a contrast between reality and fantasy and sometimes set themselves in a suspenseful tone, rather than just going full loony. Going back to Europe, the pioneering avant-garde works of UPA inspired many Croatian animators to form the award-winning Zagreb film of animation with their own modernist style. Considering that Europe was affected by World War II worse than any other continent, one would think that their styles would be more gloomy than America's. Yet their methods look so similar in both form and color that one would assume they were made in America. Perhaps the reasoning was that Croatia, then Yugoslavia, split from the communist regime led by Stalin in 1948, allowing artists to create their work without much censorship or Soviet realism. As a result, the artists created their own films the way they wanted, resulting in boldly entertaining cartoons unified in design, tone, and message, another revolutionary step in steering towards abstract designs. Co-founder of Zagreb film Tuzan Vukotic won an Oscar for his short film Surogat, making him the first foreign animator to win the prestigious award. The short is a dark comedic tale of a man who uses inflatable substitutes as everyday objects while going to the beach, such as a scantily clad woman, a buff surfer, and even a shark. Alongside being really funny, the oversimplified geometric characters and props really display an abstract setting while still resembling our own world. The flat angled characters look like real world objects that have been reduced to their basic shape structures, such as triangular noses and circular stomachs. In addition, the water has a more textured approach that is created in various hues of blues. This adds to the simple story that satirizes the modern age and how self-absorbed people can get in their own vanities, mainly by trying to overcomplicate things when life in itself is relatively simple. Considering that everything the man uses is a substitute that needs inflation to work, it's possible that the short is a commentary on how life is so basic even though we try to make it more complex. Where Moonbird was an emphasis on child simplicity, this short satirizes the absurdities of life and self-importance of oneself, something common in a post-World War II era when people were mocking how others interpreted life. And lastly, with the popularity of television and its rapidly produced content demanding to be simplified and crude, the British animation studio Howls and Bachelor created some of the first animated entertainment on television in the late 50s and early 60s, including Fufu the Stowaway. This comical story of a poor man trying to sneak onto a ship utilizes cartoonish settings and characters to tell its story without dealing too much with movement, design, or color. Similar to Surrogats, the oversimplified characters and backgrounds fit with the comedic style while recreating how things are. One particular set piece at the beginning is a splendid mix of medieval and modernist design with Greek arches and mid-20th century windows. The thick brushstroke lines and glossy paints give certain areas in the cruise ship, like a dinner table, subtle depth without putting in too much detail. The muted colors visually paint this cartoon world as dreary, yet they are not particularly accurate to the real world. The short is essentially comedy found in reality, as it takes a realistic situation of a destitute man sneaking on a ship and applying worrisome colors and a modern setting to represent serious situations in the world by both bringing light to them and mocking them. Even with stringy armed humans, the short exaggerates real life in a way that feels both comical and sad in how bleak the world can be. The varying styles in these shorts came at the right time. As the book Chuck Jones' The Dream That Never Was stated, most of the world leaned away from cartoony slapstick to dark satirical content after being disillusioned by the war. This is true in all the aforementioned animations, as they not only lampooned society, but also tackled deep themes such as macabre settings and overcomplicating the simplicities of life. 
So in conclusion, the casualties of World War II caused the public from viewing animation with optimism to soon focusing more on other aspects of the art form. Art has imitated life since its inception from global evolution, and the Second World War left quite an impact on society, leading more animation to be represented in a unique format. With smaller budgets and a more open view on the world after the infamous war, abstract animation would be interpreted in multiple genres and styles, from comedy to drama to even horror. As of today, these works are still inspiring people like music video directors and creators of animated TV shows. In spite of the pessimism that still goes on in the world, these artists are trying to highlight optimism and hope in their work to influence people to look at things with a more open mind. This in turn could lead to future artists analyzing what made their work unique.